The Amagi class. Well, I've done the G3s. And I've done the Lexingtons. It seems fair, and only proper, to also consider the third class. And no, I don't know why I just did that weird thing. None at all. The Imagi class are interesting, but so is their starting point. Japan is always reacting to outside influences. It's always building, to be honest, the bare minimum to try and counter it. One of the things that is a constant in their construction is the need for large cruisers who will do the cruiser role in peacetime, who will do the cruiser role in wartime, but in wartime will also be large enough and powerful enough that they can assist the battle fleet. This is, of course, the force which is the cornerstone of the group that ends up fighting in the Russo-Japanese War at the Battle of Tashima. This means that when the Japanese get to constructing battle cruisers, and as I've talked about in many videos now, there is a spectrum of capital ships, if we want to group them into that, in terms of the gunnery capital ships, Modern capital ships being things, to an extent, aircraft carriers, ballistic missile submarines, those things. Not nuclear submarines, uh, and any SSN or any SSK. They're not capital ships, but that's a whole other debate. But a capital ship is something which you build that is going to inf carry influence and diplomatic and significant impact of its own as a demonstration of intent. So... The ballistic missile submarines fulfill that role by providing the constant presence of nuclear retaliation, nuclear ballistic missile strikes, should anyone decide to attack the, uh, the nation that possesses them. They are very difficult to find, to kill, and therefore to prevent launching. And... Whilst I don't agree with the philosophy of the bomb will always get through, or even the ballistic missile will always get through, there are various nations which have all sorts of elaborate defences in plan, they are hard enough to stop and cause enough damage if they do hit that, frankly, everyone has to take notice of them, and therefore there is a ceiling of conflict that things do not tend to rise above. Do, using nuclear weapons against British forces or British mainland, etc. The understanding is this is will carry will result in a retaliation. So it's a capital strategic asset. It's a strategic weapon and it's a diplomatic weapon. Aircraft carriers, because of their status in the modern surface fleet and the air power they bring and the, the whole sort of rigmarole that comes with an aircraft carrier, especially in diplomacy and command strata means it's a capital asset. The same is actually true for LHDs and quite a lot of amphibious ships because they exist to uh, to demonstrate and deploy power. So those are sort of capital ships because of what they deploy. And then you have a range of cruisers and escorts and, well, cruising vessels. They might be called cruisers. They might not be called cruisers. They, can, they still fill their roles escorts and you know submarines and submarines have this really weird thing because in peacetime and wartime their entire thing is to not be seen whereas a key part of everything of most capital vessels other than ballistic missile submarines is to be a visible deterrent a visible threat but submarines are an invisible deterrent. You don't know where they are, you don't know what they're doing, until they start hitting things, if things work to plan. And their utility in peacetime is mostly intelligence operations and discrete missions. And their utility in war goes up dramatically, because they suddenly have many, many roles. A submarine can't stop an enemy ship surface ship from doing something unless it sinks it though. Whereas your own surface ship can block it. A submarine can't deter an opponent from doing something unless you tell them it is there. 
and the moment you tell them there is a submarine there, you both raise the level of threat and raise the antagonism, and also kind of reveal that they need to start turning on their anti-submarine warfare gear. Which is why submarines are not capital ships. But what this interestingly means is that for the Japanese, their capital ships, their cruisers were always sort of in the capital ship dimension. And so when you look at the development of the gunnery capital ship in terms of the Dreadnought era, where you have, to start off with the Dreadnought, let's say on this one, the Dreadnought battleship, and at this end you have what starts out as Dreadnought armoured cruisers, but then become battle cruisers, two words. They start out being called Dreadnought Armor Cruisers, but very quickly get transferred to Battle Cruisers, two words. It's basically ordered under one title, and then they transition over. And if you go through the things in the middle, you have Battle Cruisers, two words, and Battle Cruisers, one word. And the difference is basically Battle Cruisers, two words, are existing to do the cruising role on large. They will destroy all cruisers, everything below them, in size. Their job is to go around the world, do the presence mission, trade protection. They are sort of things like Lexington's are aiming for. Lexington class, really, of this, this generation we're talking about. The G3s and the Amagis, though, are both on the battle cruiser one word section. And this sort of comes in later on, but this basically means the battle cruiser, which is orientated around killing other battle cruisers. More specifically, the ones which are two word battle cruisers. Now, the other mention on the Spectrum, of course, is the Fast Battleship. And basically, this Inspire Spectrum is, they will have a similar calibre of guns. But as it goes from Battle Cruisers, hang on, which word? Uh, battle Cruisers, to Dreadnought battle, to Battleships, they will exchange speed for armour, and subdivision. So, so, as, man, it's from this side, isn't it? As you get further along, you have more subdivision, you have more armor, and you slowly become more and more battleshipy. But you also lose speed and possibly range, and more than likely the kind of living space which makes long deployments far more tolerable. So where a ship fits on this spectrum can be at times subjective. For example, the Congo class definitely start off as battle cruisers, one word. But there is a debate as to whether or not they end up as fast battleships or not, because they certainly get closer to what the area we call a fast battleship. But because it's a spectrum, we have sort of points on them, and it's where you sort of judge that pointing of fast battleship or battle cruiser. Now, interesting things are some people tend to go, tend to go. Ah, well, you know, if this has lighter guns, it must be a battle cruiser rather than a fast battleship. No. And there's a very good reason why that doesn't have an impact. If, let's say, as with a certain class, it has 11-inch guns rather than the 15-inch guns they'd have preferred when building them, because all they have available are the 11-inch guns, they are still building a fast battleship. They just have a puny armaments industry, and therefore do not, uh, therefore are building something which is criminally underarmed for its role. It does not transfer uh, suddenly make a fast battleship which is built with the armor and with the subdivision of a fast battleship into a battle cruiser. It just doesn't. Same as, just because their battle cruisers were slightly more heavily armoured and tended to be slightly slower than their other counterparts, doesn't make them, mass uh, them magically become fast battleships. Because, again, it's subdivision. It's a lot of things within it, the vessel. And the really interesting, of course, are the Congos, which are the classic Presidium Argies, as... They are built as battle cruisers, but as you know, as I said already, there are some, like my good friend Drak NFL, who will always say they are always battle cruisers. 
They are always referred to as battle cruisers in Japanese writing. Therefore, they are always battle cruisers. And that's a perfectly valid case to make. There are others like myself who will go, well, the rebuilding didn't just include armor. It included restructuring internally and increasing subdivision and increasing the organization within. And it did materially change them from being really fundamentally capable of doing the long cru cruising role in the same level of comfort as they had previously. To that, they are not, definitely don't become battleships, but I would say they certainly have become fast battleships of a type. They are closer to the fast battleship Porsche uh, position on that spectrum than they are to the battle cruiser portion on that spectrum. If we're starting from battle cruiser over here, battle cruiser one word, battle cruiser two words, fast battleship, dreadnought, you know, full battleship. I'd say they are getting far closer to this point on the spectrum than here where they began. But where does this mean the Amagis go? Well, the Amagis are battle cruisers of their period, and I can tell you they're battle cruisers definitely because the very same 8 8 fleet which they are planning on building. That 8-8 fleet, which is this crucial formation they are constructing, and these are part of. They're first being the two Nagato class, and then the two Tossers, and then the four Amagis, so that's four battleships, four battle cruisers. But the next eight ships are the fast battleships of the key class, and then the first the number 13 class and why would I say the key class is a fast battleship because they are the moment you look at their design you go ah, that speed all that organization you're a fast battleship aren't you yep and it's a very capable design the number 13 is probably some of the most scary battleships considered by anyone But that does sort of rearrange the 8-8 strategy and the 8-8 idea because it makes it go from being a scenario where you have eight battleships and eight battle cruisers, which originally you must consider they might have been going for, to four battleships, four battle cruisers, and eight fast battleships. Okay, yes. One's a, uh, one designs a 30 knot class ship and one's a 29.75 knot class ship. Everyone's going to be crying over that quarter of a knot. I mean, there are going to be people debating that quarter of a knot to the nth degree. And I should know they do love to win destroyers. James Book Plug. Second edition, out. Soon, or out now, actually. It's a scenario where you've got the Japanese building these ships and certainly developing these ships for one reason and one reason only. They need to cover themselves. And these Amagi class battle cruisers are built, I would argue, with the sole intention, the sole intention, of being able to protect Japanese commerce, to provide the information, and be the high-speed arm of the fleet. But again, they are 30 knot ships. They are a battle cruiser. They displace 40,000 tons, 41,000 tons in normal, and 47,000 tons fully loaded. Which compares quite well with, and I just was finding this image, which I wanted to add up here. Let's see if it works. Oh, and of course it appears in the wrong place. But, you know, life could be worse. Now, 
it compares quite well with the Tosa class battleships which for which they are designed on. Now the Tosa are an improved version of Nagato. So basically it goes Nagato class battleships, 31st generation, 16 inch battleships. Woohoo! And then it's going to be the Tosas. Of which of course eventually Kaga actually adjoins Akagi in becoming aircraft, an aircraft carrier because Amagi gets damaged in a earthquake. And these were 39,900 tons in normal and 44,200 tons in fully loaded. So if we think about that again, the difference between the two designs. The Amagi class are 2,200 tons heavier than normal. They are 3,000 tons heavier and fully loaded than this battleship design which they are based on. And yet, when we look at the design, and I know this kindly flips that up, there is something interesting going on here. There is something very interesting going on here, because both have 10 guns. This one, it's kind of more difficult to see, but again, it's down below. And the thing you notice about it is the central gun position, let's be honest, for an XYZ battery. Well... On the battlecruiser, it's raised up. On the battleship, it's down below. It's almost in a sort of Nelson-style, a Nelrod-style arrangement. The other thing you notice very quickly is that there's only a single stack on the battleship versus two on the battlecruiser. Everything is designed to give this more speed, more space and machinery, more everything it needs. Whereas, and I'm going to do it this way because then I can have some fun. Whereas, this is designed around survivability. This is basically everything's condensed again. It's, it's again, the scenario is. We are building something which is a battleship, and therefore it's going to have a more condensed structure. It's going to have a more honeycombed internal structure in terms of greater subdivision. It's going to have more armor, because the Tosa class, they have a waterline belt which is 11 inches thick. And Magis have a waterline belt which is 9.8 inches thick. Tosas have a four inch thick de deck armor, have a conning tower which has 14 inches and have barbettes of between nine and 12 inches. And Margis, well, they have a 3.7 inch thick deck. Their conning tower is between three and 14.2 inches, depending on where you're looking at on it. And their barbettes are between nine and 11 inches. So everything is just that little bit thinner that little bit more spread out. And all that extra weight is going into giving them speed. But the thing is, the Tosas can do 26 and a half knots. The Amagis can do 30 knots. Nangatos can do 26 and a half knots. The key class which are pretty much in there on the si uh, size and type of ship in terms of their armor and everything else. They are battleship in terms of their honeycomb structure, but they are fast battleship. They are 29.75 knots in top speed. Again, carrying five twin 16.1 inch guns. At this point, the Japanese Navy was planning on having, of their 16 ships, of their 8-8 fleet, 12 would have 16.1-inch guns. And then the number 13 class came along. 
Their speed, 30 knots. Their wardline belt, 13 inches. Their deck, 5 inches. Their structure, definitely, definitely further, not battle cruiser, definitely honeycombed. Their armament, 4 twin 18 inch guns. And it all works out. It works out as a well-designed vessel. It's got the same heavy AA armament as for the uh, for the Amagis. It has the same heavy AA armament as the G3s. It has the same firepower, virtually. As G3s. So it's got 10 16.1 inch guns. Us, I've been through before the debates over the G3s. But it's got enough firepower to fight a Lexington class, enough firepower to fight anything it might come across. And let's be honest, its firepower would have been uniform across the fleet. Do I think anything would have survived of the ships they had in service? I think the Congos might have survived. I don't see the Japanese, even with the Americans, and this is their response to the Americans launching a second building plan of 16 ships. They already in 1916 said they were going to build 16, to which the Japanese were responding with a 4 4 plan. And then the US Navy announced in 1919 another 16 ships. Wilson put forward another bill. Japanese up to an 8-8 plan. They're not building to challenge the US Navy at no point. This is one of those interesting things about this sort of race, because the Japanese from the beginning are going, we can't build as many ships, we have to build enough, with enough of a technological edge, that we have a chance. That we won't be a walkover that our opponent will have to take us seriously. We spend a lot of our time bashing the Japanese for their strategic thought and thinking that leads them down the path of war. But honestly, we should also consider that in the 1920s and 19... the post-World War I period, they have some very clear thinking going on. They know exactly what they could be facing, and yes, to an extent, they are banking on the fact that Britain is their ally. And they hope that, therefore, Britain will keep everyone else from getting involved. So they'll just be facing the Americans, and then they will fight a defensive war. Rather like they did with the Russians. Because let's be honest, in naval terms, the Russo-Japanese War is a defensive war. A blockade is a defensive tool. It stops the enemy being able to attack you. It looks offensive because you're blockading them in, but honestly, it's the easiest way of defending your trade and your access to the sea. So the Japanese would push forward. And they had some quite smart thinking. But also, there is another point to consider here. In 1920, we have the Royal Navy working on an 18-inch gun battleship. The N3. Now let's be honest, if that had been in service as well as the number 13s, the Royal Navy would have turned around to the government and gone, we need to do something about this. And there is the factor that with the US Navy planning on building 32 ships, you have to consider the Royal Navy will keep building up their force as well, or rather keep their force to an even numbers. I don't think that would have ever developed into a numerical race. Um, mainly from the perspective that the Americans would always have to divide their fleet in two. So it kind of immediately takes the heat out of it. It's not a concentrated fleet of the Americans going, we have 32 battleships. It's a scenario of the Americans going, we have 16 on the Atlantic coast and 16 on the Pacific coast. And the Royal Navy going, hmm, 
Well, we're maintaining 12 in the home fleet, 12 in the Mediterranean fleet, and 12 in the Indian Ocean. I have a feeling that would have sort of been the response. Might have been spread, I uh, might have been a little bit hard on that with assistance of Dominions if they had kept they had their fleet. So you might have had some Canadian ships and some Australian ships post World War Two, And it could have been ended up with the class and the R class being given to Australia and give to Ca uh, to Canada, etc. It might have been a way to, seem to sort of keep them viable, but also as a way to reinforce and have extra ships without also directly threatening either America or Japan. Because how can you be threatened? You have 16-inch battleships. These are old 15-inch ones. We're just giving them to other minions to reassure them. To make them feel stronger and safer. It would have been interesting diplomatic maneuvers. Let's put it this way. This is why I think whatever happens, you end up with some form of treaty system by 1930. But when you have that treaty start, makes very interesting reading. And that is today's question, by the way. What do you what do you think happens if the treaties don't take place till 1930? What do you think the navies of the world look like? But the point is, the Japanese are building a fleet which is eight fast battleships. Of which I would suggest the number 13s would form up with the Tossas and the Gatos. And would be the battle line. And I think the keys would be the second line supporting the Amakis. Yes, the number 13s could theoretically do 30 knots. But why are people so surprised by the Yamato class... Being the ships which can do 27 knots and carry 9 18.1 inch guns. When the class designed before them carried 8 18 inch guns. It's one of those things. When your opponent is honestly advertising what they're going to do. Is honestly telling you what they're going to do. And then they develop a ship and you're all going, oh, we don't have any information on this. Just look at what they were designing previously. What was the top of the line ship they were designing previously and working on previously. Because the odds are, the odds are, the research and development never went away. The research and development continued. It's kind of like the British in the 18-inch gun. Where does the 18-inch gun, gun come from that suddenly appears on Furious and all these things? Well, you can look at various scenarios where they could be developing it and where it could deploy. My favourite one is, and the one I make the case for, is HMS Argencourt, the 6th Queen Elizabeth class, which is just added on and then is stopped due to being too complicated when it's being built in a the Royal Dockyard that the Royal Navy tends to send their most interesting constructions to. And one of the most capable raw dockyards. Oh, and the dockyard which had also already built HMS Queen Elizabeth herself. So you're telling me that the people who managed to build the first of class couldn't build the sixth of the class because it was too complicated. And so therefore it wasn't worth completing in wartime. Yeah, there's something fishy going on there. And then a load of small tube boilers appear from thin air, and a load of 18 inch guns appear from thin air. It's just amazing. But leaving that to one side, the Japanese were developing 18 inch guns, the British were developing. Yamoto class are an obvious point, they're an obviously obvious point of development. The thing that's really surprised me about them is they're as slow as they are. And that to an extent tells you the problems that have developed for the Japanese since the 1920s. Because in this period, the Japanese are planning on building these ships while still being plugged into a wider and wider and far deeper pool of maritime and naval infrastructure. 
i.e. the British Maritime and Naval Infrastructure Pool. So let me explain something. Not This is not about the Japanese cheating or the Japanese copying. I'm not saying that. And it's not about the Japanese buying stuff necessarily from the UK. But the fact is, the Japanese, the Anglo-Japanese alliance had allowed for a degree of integration, a degree of connection, of information exchange between Japan's rather more limited by geography and situation and economics maritime industry and what was possibly at the time the largest maritime industry in the world okay america's is building up please note i am not saying america's is small or anything like that in this scenario but america's is building up and is still building up and is nowhere near what will become in world war ii and after World War II, when it becomes mahusive. But in this period, when you're talking about a nation whose maritime infrastructure and industry was large enough that even at the height of a naval arm, of it being involved in two naval arms races, a quantitative one with a nation across the water from it, and a qualitative one with three other nations shipyards which were large enough and big enough to be building battleships of the highest quality went bankrupt. If your infrastructure and industry is large enough that even when you are building somewhere in the region of 16 capital ships, uh, battleships and battle cruisers, in various stages of completion, on slipways, in finishing yards, all sorts of things, going for uh, at the same time, uh, not including the ones, of course, also in maintenance, and, and you have yards going bankrupt, you have a absurdly large maritime infrastructure. It also possibly has. It's also possibly due to due to the greater efficiency in ship construction going on. That these yards are going bankrupt. You know that sort of the yards which are invested in the better riveting systems, the higher speed metal pressing, are closer to the uh, closer facilities and able to do more under one, are able to deliver ships faster which makes them attractive and they can turn around slipways and finishing facilities more quickly but still but still there are limitations The Japanese infrastructure, the final point about the Japanese and the Amagi class, is that these vessels these vessels are designed to provide the Japanese Navy with the strength it needs to do the information operation it needs to do. Again, the size, scale, the scope of the Pacific is coming back to dictate to them. It has to. It always will do. Geography always wins in naval warfare. Mainly because a ship versus a lighthouse, as the joke goes, when the lighthouse measures the ship and goes, you are heading towards us, and the message the ship message back going, we're an aircraft carrier, you have to get out of our way, and the response from the lighthouse is, we're a lighthouse. Yeah. It's just as rocks and physical objects and islands are physical things you have to deal with in the sea, so is the distance. And it's not just the time needed to get to places, it's the time needed to get back from places. 
And for a nation like Japan, which was seeking to demonstrate itself, to grow itself, battle cruisers were just as important for them in fulfilling that global presence mission as the Lexingtons were for the US Navy. I have no doubt that if built, the class most seen wandering around the world, and again, this fits with them being 16 inch gunships rather than the 18 inch gunships, would have been the Amakis. They would have sailed around the world high speed, low drag, wandering around going, look at us. Look how powerful, how capable we are. I'd also be interested in seeing what the next four British ships would be after the end freeze, but we'll leave that to one side. For the British, going to a pace of building four capital ships, because the Americans weren't really going to be upping the pace to construction to more than two or three capital ships entering service a year. So for the Royal Navy, they just probably maintain numbers by keeping to sort of a similar level. The Americans are going to peak at four a year. The British can do four a year without stretching. It's going to cost money, but again, as the British historical statistics will tell you if you read it, they could afford it. As for the Japanese, well, as for the Japanese, they have a slightly more problematic future, because I think the Amagis get completed. I think, though, the number, the keys, they're going to be stretching it, and the number 13s. The number 13s would have been interesting. But there again, they had time to build up to them. They were pacing themselves. Whether they'd have entered water as completed by 1930 is a very, very different matter. I Maybe one or two would have entered service. I doubt all four would be in service by 1930. I think you would have seen, due to economics, an enforced slow pace of construction. But that wouldn't have mattered. Because what we'd have spent most of that period doing is seeing going around the wood, hood, dashing around looking dashing, the G3s being menacing everywhere, probably Renown and a Repulse still hanging around because, frankly, the Royal Navy would be going, yeah, we need presence. Might even have Tiger around. So it might even be two squadrons of battle, uh, a full squadron of battle cruisers of eight vessels kept by the Royal Navy. And Hood will be wandering around the G3s. G3s could well be better ones to forward base. They could well end up getting the Indian Ocean assignment because they are able to do more harbours. But it might be a pair of G3s in Indian Ocean with the Renown and Pulse. And the other pair of G3s, Hood and uh, Tiger, wandering between the Mediterranean and the Home Fleet. You know, just showing up where you need a battlecruiser. You probably have the slow squadron of R's and N's based in the UK 
sort of those nine sitting in nine mothership sitting in home fleet and then you have the Queen Elizabeth's probably forming the backbone of the Mediterranean fleet and whatever comes after the uh, the ends would be somewhere out would be in other places especially if the, it depends how many ships the US Navy managed to build again by 1930 I don't know Ultimately, the point to remember, and this is where I'll sort of finish, the Japanese were not being absurd with their construction plans in terms of the Amakis. They were perfectly feasible for them to finish off. And the Keys, perfectly feasible for them to finish off. I would say the keys as fast battleships are going to take more effort than they necessarily think they are, and probably going to take longer to finish out than they think they are. And I would say it's interesting to note that, of course, the 18-inch gun program had only really just begun when the 13s had been designed. So, again, as I said, I think those will be later. I do not see them being launched contemporaneously with the Royal Navy's ends. I see the ends possibly being adapted with the Royal Navy. Uh, you know, there is a fact that they are to come after the G's and hadn't been ordered yet at that point. They were entirely on paper. So there was plenty of time for the end design to be adapted and maybe find itself accelerated a little bit because yeah, the Royal Navy might be producing what is probably the most armoured ship they can produce but if they think it's going to drop significantly behind the others they might well go we want up the speed a bit I could see them upping that class's speed to about 27, 28 knots they don't need you don't need to go up to the power to get to 30 knots you don't need to. It's, it'd be lovely to have 30 knots, but you don't need to. To threaten a 30 knot battleship, you need to be able to do 29, 28 knots. Because as long as you're within 2 knots of them, a bad day or a lucky hit, and they're not getting away from you. And even at, and at 30 knots to 28 knots, they can't dictate the range like they can with in, in a scenario, as long as uh, to dictate range, you need a three to four knot advantage. Oh no! Thank you for watching. What have we got coming up? Well, the Battle of Hakodate has already happened because this is coming out on the twelfth, and Brew Ships one hundred and eleven has happened. That was hopefully specialist books. And yesterday, Patron 78 happened. I have no idea what Patron 78 is. As I'm recording this, Patron is live. Uh, the suggestions are live. And yeah, we're all building up towards June. Thank you very much for watching, and hope you enjoyed.